Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the FAA's Noise Research and Neighborhood Environmental Survey webinar. My name is Jim Heilman, and I am the FAA's Chief Scientific and Technical Advisor for Environment Energy. For tonight's presentation, we have assembled a panel of experts to present information on FAA's Noise Research Program, including details on the recently released Neighborhood Environmental Survey and analysis on aircraft noise annoyance. We are recording the webinar and it will be posted at faa.gov slash go slash aviation noise, as well as on FAA's YouTube channel. Questions and comments made during this webinar on the FAA's noise research programs and neighborhood environmental survey will not be recorded to the federal docket. To make an official comment, a link to the federal register notice is also available at the same website I gave before www.faa.gov slash go slash aviation noise. The comment period opened on January 13th, 2021, and will be open for a 60 day period. During the workshop, you may submit questions by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of the Zoom window. A window will open and you may enter your question there. People who are watching the workshop on the FAA's YouTube or Facebook pages may enter comments in the chat areas on comment boxes or in comment boxes. We will answer as many questions as time allows that pertain to the noise research and survey. Questions that are repetitive may not be answered and we will not be able to answer questions that are on other topics during this webinar. We know this information is of considerable interest to all of you attending virtually with us tonight and we look forward to the opportunity to present this material and address your questions. And we're very grateful that you're taking your time to be with us to learn more. Uh, to start things off, let me introduce you to our panelists from both the FAA and our technical team. Once again, my name is Jim Heilman and I am the FAA's Chief Scientific and Technical Advisor for Environment and Energy. With me tonight, um, we have Don Scotta, He's the Noise Division Manager within the FAA Office of Environment and Energy. Joe Check, he's a Principal Consultant from HMMH. And we have Eric Jots, Associate Director at Westat. To kick things off, I'm going to provide um, an introduction to aircraft noise as well as the FAA's noise research program. Um, so by way of introduction, um, and reminder, we, the FAA, released a Federal Register Notice to provide an overview on the agency's noise research programs alongside the results of the Neighborhood Environmental Survey. Um, we'll refer to it as the survey in these slides. We are seeking public comment on our research program as well as the survey results within the Federal Register Notice. Um, we recognize that aircraft noise continues to be a challenge and we have a longstanding noise research program specifically focused on this topic. As a part of our research program, we decided to conduct a national survey to gather data to improve our understanding of the community response to aircraft noise. We wanted quantitative data um, that we could look to for this. Um, but it's important for all of us to know that addressing aviation noise will require meaningful collaboration among all aviation stakeholders, of, including, of course, the FAA. Um, so the briefing as a whole will provide some perspectives on aircraft noise, an overview of FAA noise research, details on the survey, including results from the survey, and we'll conclude with next steps as we begin a review of our noise policy and engage with stakeholders. So when one considers uh, noise from aircraft, it, it's important to, to think about the two perspectives that we in the FAA think about. Um, so everyone who experiences aircraft noise um, understands that there's a variety of sources on an aircraft that contribute to the noise that we hear. And as an aircraft passes overhead, you'll hear the engine fan, um, the high lift systems, the undercarriage if it's on approach. Um, you'll hear the jet exhaust as it's flying away from you. And depending on takeoff or approach and the specifics of the procedure, um, these will have varying um, loudness. The way we, the FAA, um, certify or, or limit the noise that an individual aircraft makes is through airworthiness. 
Um, and we do this based on three specific measurement points on the landing and takeoff cycle, one for approach and then two on takeoff. And we limit the amount of noise that an aircraft is allowed to make. Um, and we've been doing this for many decades. Now, however, we know that communities experience noise in a different way and an individual living um, in any place experiences noise based on the type of aircraft that are flown, the fleet mix, the tempo, how many are flying during the day, how many at night, and where the people are living in relation to the airports and the flight paths. Um, so we think a lot about both of these, both the individual aircraft levels from the certification standpoint, as well as what the communities experience from a community noise perspective. <clears throat> and we've been tracking noise for quite a while now. Um, so the chart that you're looking at now um, shows the number of people who are exposed to a day-night noise level of 65 dB. Um, and these number of people um, since the 1970s that are exposed. And our data shows that when the mid 70s, we had roughly 7 million people exposed to this particular noise level. Um, that level um, decreased dramatically for several decades. And then over the last decade has been um, fairly constant at a lower level, um, roughly 90% decrease in community noise exposure. Um, now, at the same time, the number of employments, number of, of passengers flying has increased by nearly a factor of five. Um, so in, in some ways there's success here, but what really is, it's, it's a nuanced story because the noise experience of today is very different than it was in decades past. So if one were to go back to the 1970s, you would have, you know, obviously much fewer operations than today. And the aircraft that were operating were much louder. In fact, uh, an aircraft from the 1970s produced roughly the same acoustic energy as 10 to 30 aircraft operations today. Uh, so the graphic on the right hand side um, conveys something important about the day night noise level. Um, you can get to that level of 65, either through one very loud event, 10 loud events, or perhaps 100 moderately loud events. Um, and I use those terms because uh, noise is subjective. Um, but a way to think about this is um, I could use myself and my six-year-old daughter as an analogy. Um, and you can think of me as the 1970s aircraft. I might come by your house two times a day, three times a day, knock on the door. And if you answer, I'd stomp on your foot and you obviously you would find that annoying. Um, however, today it may be more akin to my six-year-old um, little girl coming to your door, knocking, you know, let's say a hundred times during the day, um, and she might stomp on your foot. Now, any individual stomp may not be painful, but over the course of the day, that many times you probably get your attention. Um, so it's, it's a different experience today than in the past. And so the other thing that's happened, and this is particularly true in the last decade, is we've had efforts to modernize the national air transportation system. And these have required changes in aircraft operational procedures. So while modernization is needed to increase public safety and system efficiency, the changes in operational patterns have also led to increased concerns about aircraft noise. And while these airspace redesigns have been taking place, operations by air carriers have also increased. Um, so I didn't wanna just talk to this, I wanted to share some data and this is from Boston Logan. Um, and the upper right hand data is the annual air carrier operations over um, roughly the, the 2010s. Um, and you can see that the operations um, have increased by uh, nearly a factor of two. Now during that same period of time, uh, there was airspace redesigns in the Boston area um, that have led to the airspace that you see on the lower right hand side um, with uh, departures in red and arrivals in green. And a number of the flight paths um, have been concentrated to allow for a more efficient um, and safe use of the airspace. Um, however, that has resulted um, the airspace change along with uh, the commensurate change in operations has led to a number of people um, well outside of this uh, day-night noise level of 65 expressing concerns um, about aircraft noise and sharing it with, uh, this is data from uh, Massport, the, the, the airport authority, um, but we on the FAA um, also um, get concerns and we're well aware of the fact that airport communities that are outside the, the NL65 contour are expressing concerns 
about aircraft noise. And as I've noted, we have a research program thinking through this space. While challenges exist, airspace system updates, including the introduction of PBN, they could also provide noise benefits. Um, so we, we understand that there are concerns, but we also want to note um, that there's opportunity. Um, and so the graphic in the upper right hand side um, just you know, gives a, a simplistic view of how an idle thrust descent can reduce noise on approach. Um, you, you have lower thrust, you have more precision of where you put the flight, and this will reduce the track miles flown, thus um, reducing the noise for that particular operation as well as reducing fuel use and emissions. Uh, however, in, it's going to potentially have the aircraft onto you know, a more narrow corridor. And in some instances, that's very beneficial. So in the lower right hand is data from John Wayne Airport showing how different procedures have been implemented and have decreased the number of people that are overflown by aircraft um, because the flights, the departure flights can more closely follow a waterway that's very close to the airport. There are challenges and opportunities in this space. So recognizing that aircraft noise is a concern, we've embarked on an effort to improve our understanding. So in addition to this, the, we and the FAA have made efforts to meaningfully engage communities on noise concerns and will continue to enhance these efforts. And, and before getting into the, the research side, I wanted to note a couple of these. We've hired community engagement officers across each FAA region to expand the reach of the regional administrators into communities. We're working with airports and their noise officers to address legacy community noise concerns. We're working with roundtables across the country to continuously provide information and expertise as they have asked for airspace changes. We're working with our air traffic organization to review procedures to see if there are opportunities to reduce noise across the country. And we've implemented a noise portal nationwide through our regional aircraft noise and community involvement web pages to ease the communication. Um, in addition to these, we've specifically added research projects to our portfolio in a number of areas, including on airspace management concepts. And we're doing this to determine if there are options that are safe and may provide a net environmental benefit. So I now want to go a little bit more depth into our FAA noise research program. Um, so we have the vision at the FAA of removing environmental constraints on aviation growth by achieving quieter, cleaner, and more efficient air transportation. That's obviously a long-term vision, but it's important to have something that one works toward as, as a guiding star in our efforts. And we've worked closely with a number of industry, academic, and governmental stakeholders to assemble a comprehensive portfolio of research activities. And these can be broadly grouped into three buckets. The first is to understand the effects of aircraft noise on individuals and communities. The second broad bucket is in terms of noise modeling metrics and what we refer to as environmental data visualization. And the third is on noise reduction, abatement, and mitigation. And I'll talk about each of these three in turn in the coming slides. So within the first bucket, uh, the, the highlight is the neighborhood environmental survey. And you'll have to wait just a little bit longer to hear about that as I cover the other topics. But the, the other areas that we cover within the Federal Register Notice on, on our research program, the first of those is in terms of speech interference and children's learning need to give credit where credit is due. The Environmental Protection Agency in the 1970s did considerable and very good work to understand the impact of noise on speech interference. And we continue to leverage that work. Building on that area, we in the FAA have been working um, with the National Academies through the Airport Cooperative Research Program to investigate whether there are concerns or considerations warranting more detailed studies in terms of the potential effects of aviation noise on reading comprehension and learning motivation in children. And a link to one of these studies is given at the bottom. And we continue to think about what additional follow-on work could be of use. And need to note, while additional research in this area is still being explored, 
the FAA has um, already invested more than 440 million in sound insulation treatments at schools around the country in order to mitigate any potential issues relating to aircraft noise. So in addition to those efforts, we have a robust program looking at the potential impacts of aircraft noise on health and human impacts. And that's because while uh, annoyance provides a useful summary measure that captures public perceptions of noise, a full understanding of the impacts of noise on communities requires a careful consideration of the potential physiological impacts as well. And so along these lines, uh, we have a longstanding research partnership with the, the Boston University School of Public Health to understand the relationship between aircraft noise exposure and cardiovascular health. And to do this, we're leveraging some um, longstanding and uh, very well-respected health cohorts and adding aircraft noise as one of the confounding potential factors in health outcomes. And we're also working closely with the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine to conduct a national sleep study that will quantify the impact of aircraft noise exposure on sleep. And in addition, we're working closely with researchers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology to conduct an empirical assessment of the economic impacts to businesses located underneath aircraft flight paths, as well as to update some previously done work to understand how um, aircraft noise exposure affects housing values. Another area where we are spending considerable effort is in terms of modeling metrics and visualization of the data. And this is really a core component of our work to address aircraft noise. In addition, it's a requirement within environmental regulations, such as the National Environmental Policy Act. So first among these is our aviation environmental design tool. AEDT is FAA's required noise and environmental modeling application for all U.S. domestic regulatory analyses that require an FAA review. We use it extensively for a wide number of things in addition to this. In addition, it's actually the primary tool used by the International Civil Aviation Organization's Committee on Aviation Environmental Protection to do their noise emissions and fuel burn analysis. It is truly a global gold standard. Building from the high fidelity noise modeling capabilities within AEDT, we in the FAA are also working to develop an updated noise screening tool to streamline environmental reviews and other requirements under the National Environmental Policy Act. We're also developing ways to utilize geospatial data to improve the agency's ability to communicate environmental data to the public through our environmental data visualization efforts. And further to assist the public in understanding noise impacts and to better facilitate communication among communities interested in systematic departure flight track dispersion, among other reasons, we in the FAA are working to assess the use of potential supplemental metrics. And I would note here that on the bottom of each of these slides, there are links. And in this one, a report to Congress, as well as to ongoing research to advance our knowledge in this space. So in addition to um, better understanding the problem, developing modeling capabilities to quantify the problem, we're also seeking solutions that can mitigate, reduce, or abate the problem. And we have multiple research efforts on this. So the, the first of these is in terms of aircraft source noise reduction. Earlier in my briefing, I showed the historical decrease in the number of people exposed to aircraft noise. And the single most influential factor in that historical decline in going from roughly 7 million people exposed to this noise level to roughly 400,000 today is the phase transition from noisier aircraft to those quieter aircraft, the aircraft that we have flying today. And through the public-private partnership of the Continuous Lower Energy Emissions and Noise Program, our CLEAN program, the FAA, we are working closely with industry to develop technologies, accelerate their development actually, to get them into the fleet sooner. And we're working to enable manufacturers to create aircraft 
and engines with lower noise and emissions as well as improved fuel efficiency. And then as new aircraft and engine technologies, as these enter the fleet, as noise levels come down, the FAA works to establish aircraft certification standards to ensure that the quietest aircraft are in operation. So in terms of noise abatement, the FAA is supporting multiple efforts to identify means to abate noise through changes in how aircraft are operated in the airspace. So noise reduction is a reduction in noise at the source, so quieter engines and airframes. Noise abatement is to reduce the noise through the operation of the vehicle. And in the immediate vicinity of an airport, the use of voluntary noise abatement departure procedures, this has been a long-standing technique available to reduce noise and is still in use today. And in a recent partnership with the Massachusetts Port Authority, Massport and MIT, we, the FAA, have been jointly conducting work to understand how area navigation uh, PBN procedures could be designed and implemented to reduce noise. And I referred to some of this earlier in my briefing. And some of the recently completed work out of that Massport MIT FAA partnership shows that for modern aircraft on departure, changes in aircraft climb speed actually have minimal impacts on the overall aircraft departure noise. Some of our preliminary work showed that this was a potential area, a potential opportunity, but we do what all researchers should do. We ask tough questions, we sharpen the pencil, we work closely with NASA and Boeing, and we improve the modeling and realize that that actually would not lead to, to a meaningful noise reduction. And there's a report on that uh, that's linked here. And we're also examining the potential for helicopter noise abatement through changes in operational procedures. And there's a link to that work as well at the bottom. So finally, in terms of noise mitigation, mitigation within the FAA is efforts to take actions to reduce the impact of aircraft noise exposure that's already occurred. So we have a couple of strategies that we use. First is to encourage responsible land use planning in airport communities. The second is the application of sound insulation treatments where entities are eligible for homes or other noise sensitive public buildings such as schools or hospitals. And third is the acquisition of homes and the conversion to non-residential land use in extreme cases where sound insulation technologies cannot provide adequate mitigation. Um, I should note that as sound insulation treatment costs has continued to rise and new research on the human impacts from noise becomes available, the FAA, we in the FAA will explore the costs and benefits of the existing noise mitigation strategies and technologies such that we can better direct where and how our mitigation resources should be applied. And along these lines, I'd like to note that some recent academic research has raised questions about the benefits of sound insulation relative to the, the cost of applying them. So with this, I'm um, very happy to hand the presentation over to Don Scotta, who will talk about the Na Neighborhood Environmental Survey. Thanks, Jim. Now I'll spend a few minutes talking about the Neighborhood Environmental Survey and starting with the purpose and motivation for conducting the survey. First thing is, we, I want to say, the FAA recognizes that aircraft noise continues to be a challenge. As part of our long-standing noise research program to better understand the impacts of aircraft noise on human health and welfare, we decided that a new national survey should be conducted to gather data to improve our collective understanding of how communities are currently responding to aircraft noise. The survey is the first noise annoyance survey conducted by a U.S. federal agency since the FICON, the Federal Interagency Committee on Noise, performed an in-depth U.S. government agency review of human annoyance to noise in 1992. FAA's goal for the survey was to obtain updated information about the way that people perceive aircraft noise. The Neighborhood Environmental Survey was a survey that FAA conducted to over 10,000 people living near 20 representative airports regarding annoyance related to aircraft noise. We followed up with 2,000 of those respondents to obtain qualitative information regarding individual responses. The responses to the survey were used to develop a nationally representative dose response curve, which is a tool that establishes the relationship between annoyance and noise exposure. 
The results of the survey show a substantial increase in public annoyance to aircraft noise compared to the data that FAA and other agencies currently rely on to inform our noise policy, which was acquired in the 1970s. While the results of the survey bring forward new data, they are consistent with the observed trend of increasing noise concerns and consistent with the results of more recent surveys conducted outside the United States. At the outset, the survey team assembled by the FAA decided to survey communities around a set of airports that represent the air nation's airports at a whole, as a whole. You can see here on this slide the 20 airports that were selected, and we'll hear more from Joe in a few minutes about the selection process and some of those details. The NES results support an observed increase in annoyance from aircraft noise. The results show a substantial increase in annoyance for the population living in the vicinity of airports. The increase of an, in annoyance is generally consistent across various levels of noise exposure. You can see here a comparison between the Schultz curve on the left and the new national curve on the right, which is signified through the dark, bold, the bold blue line. The new survey was designed to use a consistent approach across East Airport Community Survey. This has allowed for an enhanced ability to provide additional statistical information about new results, such as the 95% confidence interval limits, and a range of results from each of the 20 airports as shown on the plot above to the right. This was not possible with the older Schultz curve. Now I'll hand it over to Joe Check, who will dig a bit more into the noise modeling and airport selection details of the NES. Thanks, Don. Um, Hello everyone, my name is Joe Check, and I was the project manager for HMH's efforts on the NES starting back in 2016. I'm going to walk us through the four topics listed on the screen, focusing on how the dose in the dose response curve was generated. To level set everyone, I will start with two slides explaining the day-night average sound level, the noise metric describing the dose. Then I'll briefly discuss the study that served as a pilot study for the NES. We'll then spend several slides on describing how the airports for the NES were selected. I'll wrap up my section by describing the noise modeling process used to compute day-night average sound level. Without going into the mathematics, day-night average sound level, or DNL, is a way to describe a person's cumulative noise exposure over a 24-hour period with a single number. DNL accounts for the noise levels of single events and how many occur during that 24-hour period, typically on an annual average basis. The bar chart on the right shows hourly aircraft sound levels for each hour of the day. The dark blue bars depict the metrics weighting of sound levels during nighttime hours by 10 decibels to account for hour increased sensitivity to noise during those hours. Nighttime is defined as the hours between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. The gold line in the graphic is the result in DNL for the day, or 66 decibels, based on those hourly sound levels during the daytime period and the weighted nighttime hourly sound levels. As DNL is the FAA's standard noise metric for its studies of aviation noise exposure, the analysis of the Neighborhood Environmental Survey computed DNL from aircraft operations. This slide depicts the fact that day-night average sound level accounts for noise, the noise level of each event and the numbers of those events during a 24-hour period. It also depicts that because of its logarithmic nature, the same value of DNL can originate from 1, 10, or 100 daily events whose single event sound exposure levels differ by up to 20 decibels. Contours are formally defined as an outline, especially one re representing or bounding the shape or form of something. In the context of environmental noise, contours are outlines of equal noise value. Thus, DNL contours are lines of equal DNL. The graphic shown in this slide depicts DNL contours in shades of blue for an arrival, shown by the red track and airplane, and a departure, shown by the green track and airplane. Each blue line is a noise contour, equal sound magnitude, and increases in value with darkness. For a typical airport, DNL contours from aircraft operations are drawn from a grid of thousands of points, a grid usually extending miles away from the airport, with a spacing between each point of 500 feet or less. An analog to noise contours is elevation contours on topographic maps. Topographic maps show lines of equal ground elevation. Initial research. One of the achieved objectives of the National Academies of Sciences Airport Cooperative Research Program, or ACRP project number 02-35, which was titled Research Methods for Understanding Aircraft Noise Annoyances and Sleep Disturbance, was to conduct a preliminary research into the study design and methods of conducting and executing a nationwide annoyance survey. This project researched modes by delivering the survey by mail, telephone, web, and in person. A combination of mail and telephone modes were identified as the best fit for this research. 
The project facilitated the proper design of the mail and telephone questionnaires and fielded a pilot survey in the communities around three airports, San Diego International Airport, Portland International Airport, and General Edward Lawrence Logan International Airport. The results of this project were published in a public-facing report and presented to a panel prior to the start of and providing an invaluable resource for the Neighborhood Environmental Survey. It is important to note, because these three airports were included in the ACRP project, they were excluded from consideration for the Neighborhood Environmental Survey. The reasoning was that respondents in those communities had already been sampled and exposed to the survey instruments. Including them in the NES would have led to statistical complications and potential bias in the data. Initial airport selection. With criteria specified by the FAA, a multi-stage and statistically rigorous process was used to select a representative sample of U.S. airports. Starting with hundreds of airports in the national airspace system provided by the FAA, eligibility criteria were established to define a sampling frame consisting of airports in the contiguous U.S. with at least 100 annual average daily jet, jet operations, at least 100 people exposed to a day-night average sound level greater than or equal to 65 decibels, and at least 100 people exposed to DNL between 60 decibels and 65 decibels. The jet operations data came from the FAA's Traffic Flow Management System Counts database for 2011. The population noise exposure data was provided by FAA. Applying this, this eligibility criteria resulted in a pool of 95 potentially eligible airports. 95 airports are depicted on the next slide and listed in the reports table 3-1. This map shows the 95 potentially eligible airports. Due to the relatively high numbers of aircraft flight operations, the FAA directed the team to include three airports, Hartsfield-Jackson Atlanta International Airport, Chicago O'Hare International Airport, and Los Angeles International Airport. The FAA also required one of three New York City area airports, and from those, LaGuardia Airport was randomly selected to be included in the study. The method used to choose the 20 airports is summarized and discussed next. A statistical technique called balanced sampling with restricted random sampling was used to select the 20 airports. Balanced sampling ensures that the sample matches the population on a predetermined subset of characteristics called the balancing factors. The six FAA chosen balancing factors are shown on the slide. The first factor was the proportion of sampled airports within each region would be approximately equal to the proportion of the 95 within that region. The second factor, average daily temperature, was chosen to ensure the sample contained airports with a range of temperatures. Previous research indicated annoyance increased with increasing temperature. Temperature data was provided by the FAA and was based on 10-year annual averages. The third factor, the percent of DNL nighttime flight operations, was chosen to ensure the selected sample of airports matched the population percentage of airports with more than 20% operations between the hours of 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. Operational data came from FAA's Traffic Flow Management System Counts database for November 1, 2011 to October 31, 2012. Because the primary objective of the survey was to develop a nationally applicable relationship between annoyance and noise exposure, the sample was intended to represent the smaller, less busy airports, as well as the larger, busier ones. Thus, the fourth balancing factor was number of average daily flight operations, which helps ensure the sample can be used to study differences that might be due to having many operations. The approximate median for all 95 airports, or 300 average daily flight operations, was chosen as the determinant of the sample division between large and small airports. It is possible that for a given noise exposure, annoyance reactions may be different depending on fleet mix. Smaller, lighter aircraft generally tend to be somewhat quieter than larger, heavier aircraft. Consequently, greater numbers of overflights of the smaller aircraft would be required to produce a cumulative noise exposure equivalent to that produced by a lesser number of large aircraft. The fifth balancing factor of fleet mix ratio ensures the sample can be used to study differences that might be due to having different fleet mix ratios. Large jet aircraft were jet-powered aircraft weighing more than 41,000 pounds. A ratio of other aircraft to large aircraft of one was selected by the FAA as the dividing value. Operational data for factors four and five came from the FAA's Enhanced Traffic Management System for 2011. The sixth factor, the population within five miles of the airport, was included because it has been hypothesized that population density could bear some relationship to annoyance. Thus, the FAA wanted a balance of airports with varied population settings, for example, rural, suburban, and urban. Population estimates were based on the 2010 U.S. Census tract level data, 
and the 95 airport mean of 230,000 people per five mile radius of area was used to divide the sample. Selected airports. This figure shows a map of the sampled airports that were chosen as the final list of 20. The airports are listed on the right. The cumulative noise exposure levels were determined for each airport via detailed aircraft noise modeling with FAA's Integrated Noise Model, or INM. Although INM was replaced in 2015 by the FAA's Aviation Environmental Design Tool, or AEDT, the noise modeling for the survey had begun prior to the release of ADT and had been used to inform the selection of the respondents. The use of INM was maintained for consistency throughout the project. Using the INM, DNL was computed twice for each airport. The first DNL computation was done in 2013 to determine which addresses were eligible for the survey and to stratify them by bands of DNL. A DNL of 50 decibels was chosen as the minimum noise exposure to be eligible for inclusion in the survey. To determine the noise model inputs, nearly a year of FAA radar flight tracking data, primarily from the 2012 to 2013 timeframe, was used. And this included data detailing aircraft flight paths, runway usage, time of day, flight occurrences, and aircraft type. Every flight path was used to compute the resulting noise exposure, not representative flight paths. Noise modeling was based on annual average daily weather conditions for each airport and included airport-specific terrain. The second DNL computation for each of the 20 airports was run in 2016 to adjust the dose for each potential respondent's address to reflect 2015 aircraft operations levels. This time frame coincided with the survey data collection. For both sets of runs, flight operations were scaled to the appropriate calendar year and balanced about arrivals departures. Pattern or circuit operations were modeled where applicable. Ground run-up operations were not modeled. Appendix F of the report provides amplifying detail about the noise modeling. Thanks for listening. Eric Jots from Westat will now discuss the mail-based survey methodology and explain how these updated noise levels were paired with survey response data to create the resulting nationally representative dose response curve. Thanks, Jill. Hello, my name is Eric Jots, and I was the project lead for Westat's efforts on the NES. I'm gonna walk us through the four topics shown here on the screen. First, I'll cover the address sampling and mail survey recruitment procedures that ensured a robust data collection. Second, I'll walk through the survey methodology and questionnaire development with a focus on the aircraft annoyance measurement. Third, I'll provide a simplified overview of dose response curves and then present the new national curve ascertained from the NES. Finally, I'll cover some of the analyses we did to better understand factors driving annoyance with aircraft noise. Let's get started with the sampling procedures. Joe covered how the airports have been selected and noise contours or dose had been calculated for each airport. Once that was done, we moved on to selecting addresses at each airport. Westat worked with a vendor to identify all household addresses within the noise contours developed by HMMH. The address lists are sourced from the United States Postal Service and are the most complete lists available. Once we had a list of addresses for each of the bands at the 20 airports, we randomly selected addresses to meet targets. Our goal is to have equal representation within each of the five DNL bands, but many airports did not have the required number of households exposed to higher noise levels. In those cases, we drew additional sample from the lower noise bands so that each airport contributed a similar number of responses to the national data set. We utilized our experience with similar efforts and results in the ACRP 02-35 to estimate the total number of requests to mail out in order to have 10,000 completed surveys or 500 per airport returned to us. We also selected additional addresses as a buffer, which we refer to as a reserve sample. The reserve sample was available in case the number of completed surveys returned to us fell below the target within any given airport's DNL band. In order to account for potential seasonal variation and annoyance, we assigned addresses to one of six ways which corresponded to different time periods across the calendar year. We monitored the number of completed survey responses within each wave by airport and DNL band and adjusted sampling rates to fine tune each subsequent wave to meet target goals. Now let's talk about how the survey was administered to selected households. The mailing protocol provided multiple opportunities for each selected address to respond. Utilizing best practices from survey research literature, we utilized a robust mail recruitment protocol consisting of four contacts with each household. The first, third, and fourth mailings included the survey, and the second was a postcard. With the exception of the second survey package, which utilized FedEx to catch the household's attention, 
The survey mailings were sent via first class postal mail in large nine by 12 envelopes. The contents of each survey package included a cover letter issued from the Department of Transportation that provided the survey's purpose and sponsorship, frequently asked questions and answers, and a paper questionnaire that the respondent was requested to complete and return via an enclosed postage paid envelope. All survey materials were provided in English and Spanish. The survey instructions requested that the adult with the next birthday complete the questionnaire. A $2 cash prepaid monetary incentive was included with the initial mail package. Prepaid incentives of this size have been shown to significantly increase response to mail surveys and are therefore a cost-effective use of funds since fewer total mail outs need to be sent. Once a household responded to our survey mailing, future contacts were ceased. If multiple surveys were returned for a household, we only retained the first. This protocol took approximately two months to administer, which when combined with the six waves over the course of the year, ensured we received survey returns throughout the calendar year, as we'll see on the next slide. As noted earlier, the survey sampling was designed to collect data over a full calendar year to account for possible seasonal variation and annoyance. While the questions, which we'll get to in a minute, ask respondents to consider the past 12 months, the literature also shows that people tend to put more emphasis on recent events when providing their response. By collecting data over a full year, we can account for that tendency. As you can see on this slide, the first survey wave was started in October 2015, and the final wave started in August 2016. At the bottom of the slide, you can see the distribution of survey returns over the calendar months. While we carefully controlled the timing of mail outs, the actual rate and timing of returns was somewhat less in our control as we were dependent upon when households returned the survey. The survey instruments were carefully designed to collect people's annoyance reactions to the aircraft noise they experienced. The two instruments used in this research effort, a mail questionnaire and a telephone questionnaire, were first developed and tested in ACRP 02-35, as noted earlier by Joe. The selection of these two survey modes was based on considerations of cost, data quality, complexity of the instrument, and comparability of results with earlier annoyance surveys. Mail surveys allow for higher participation rates versus telephone and web. Using mail also allows us to select households by their address, which was very important for this design to precisely identify households at varying noise exposure levels. Further, the mail survey participants in ACRP 02-35 aligned very well to the census demographics of the sampled area, and mail is much more cost efficient versus other methods. In order to obtain unbiased survey responses, the questionnaire was presented to the public as a general environmental survey with sponsorship noted as the Department of Transportation. The mail survey questions were limited to annoyance on a variety of factors and a few demographic questions. Households who responded to the mail survey were then invited to a follow-up telephone survey to collect more in-depth information on what may be influencing their annoyance levels. The telephone survey could allow for these questions without disclosing the purpose because, unlike the mail survey, respondents could not see all the questions prior to indicating their annoyance level. Prior to collection, all sampling and statistical methods, recruitment procedures, and materials were reviewed and approved by the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, and included requisite public notices through the Federal Register Notice. Additionally, Westat's Internal Review Board reviewed the procedures, survey, and materials to co ensure compliance with human subjects' protection standards. The mail questionnaire included the key question, thinking about the last 12 months or so, when you are here at home, how much does each of the following bother, disturb, or annoy you? The survey included 13 different environmental topics, including noise from aircraft, as shown on the slide. The main annoyance questions used in the questionnaire were based on recommendations by the International Commission on Biological Effects of Noise. Since aircraft noise was one of 13 environmental concerns listed and the sponsorship was DOT, the recipient did not know this was, in fact, an airport community noise survey. The questionnaire used a five-point scale of annoyance and the top two levels corresponding to very or extremely annoyed were combined to determine the number of people who are highly annoyed. The data from the survey, which is the single largest survey of this type undertaken at one time, was used to calculate a new national curve shown earlier by Don. This new national curve provides a contemporary picture of response to aircraft noise exposure, which I will discuss further on a subsequent slide. While the main reason we asked about other environmental factors was to control the potential for bias, we can examine them to see if survey respondents tended to report similar levels of annoyance across a variety of factors. 
The data show that for the survey respondents, the annoyance from aircraft noise is on average much higher than other environmental aspects on the survey. Note that we do not have dose for the other factors to do a rigorous comparison, but we can see from the distribution of averages that the response were clearly giving thought to the questions and differentiating between the environmental factors. Now let's talk about how the data collection effort performed. Overall, our response rate was predicted at 40% and we achieved just over 10,000 completed surveys with at least 500 per airport. This table shows the total number of survey responses within each of five bands of DNL, 50 to 55 decibels, 55 to 60 decibels, and so on. For each of the 20 airports selected, household addresses were considered based on their aircraft noise exposure. In order to ensure households exposed to a range of noise levels were included, the survey aimed to obtain a distribution of respondents in the five bands of DNL. Among the selected airports, there was a smaller pool of households exposed to DNL above 60 decibels than households exposed to lower noise levels. The drop off in households for DNL above 65 and 70 decibels was even more pronounced. As a result, the number of respondents for those noise levels were smaller than other categories. Now let's talk about how the survey results were used to produce a dose response curve, the main purpose of the NES. I'll provide a somewhat simplified explanation, but for those interested in the finer statistical details, you can read about them in the report. First, what is a dose response curve? A dose response curve is commonly used to express how a stimulus or dose correlates with a response. For example, dose response curves are widely used in pharmaceutical research to determine effective medicine doses. In our case, the dose is aircraft noise expressed as a DNL value shown on the X or horizontal axis. And the response is the reported annoyance on the Y or vertical axis. This slide shows an example of a dose response curve with underlying dots representing individual survey responses. To produce a dose response curve, you need just two values, the dose and the response, from many observations at different dose levels. In this case, a respondent with a DNL of 50 decibels with no annoyance would be plotted in the bottom left corner, while the respondent with a DNL of 75 decibels who is extremely annoyed would be plotted in the upper right corner. For this study, Annoyance is measured as a yes-no variable, whereby respondents reporting very or extremely annoyed were classified as being highly annoyed, or yes, and those who reported a lower annoyance were classified as being not highly annoyed, or no. The dose response curve is derived using a statistical method called logistic regression, which predicts the average annoyance at a given DNL value based on such binary yes-no data. The interpretation of the average annoyance at a given DNL value is the fraction of individuals exposed to that noise level whose response is a yes. The results of logistic regression have a characteristic S shape as in the graph. Now that we understand what a dose response curve is, let's look at the curved, curve derived from the NES data. Analysis of the highly annoyed responses and the associated DNL were used to generate dose response curves for each individual airport and subsequently a national dose response curve. The resulting NES nationally representative dose response curve is shown here. The national curve describes community annoyance in terms of the percentage of people who are highly annoyed and describes aircraft noise exposure in terms of the DNL noise metric. For reference, the shaded area shows the range of curves from the 20 individual airports. The solid line is the national curve, while the dashed lines show the 95% confidence intervals for the curve. If we were to replicate this study multiple times, the confidence intervals show the area that we would expect the line to fall within 95 times out of 100. The national curve is also shown plotted between aircraft noise exposure levels of DNL of 50 decibels to 75 decibels. While the curve can be mathematically extended above and below these levels, the survey only collected data within this range. The national curve shows that there is an observed increase in annoyance from aircraft noise for populations living in the vicinity of airports compared to earlier analyses. You may be wondering, since different respondents exposed to the same DNL value do not all express the same annoyance level, are there other factors at play? Prior to the survey, we identified several hypotheses that could possibly help explain differences in annoyance to aircraft noise. Additional analyses were performed to investigate whether the airport to airport differences in the dose response curves could be partially explained by these other factors. The factors are shown on this slide. Climate was characterized by the sum of cooling and heating degree days in order to create a metric that could differentiate airports where people might spend more time outdoors or with windows open. 
race ethnicity represents respondents self-reported information from the male survey and considered the ratio of minority to non-minority population. Household income was not asked in the survey, but determined using Census Bureau data to estimate the percentage of the airport's respondents living below the poverty level. Additionally, since DNL is an energy average, there could be differences in experience depending on the composition of flights across airports. To examine this, <clears throat> we analyzed noticeable flights, defined as the number of flights having a single event maximum sound level greater than or equal to 50 decibels and visible flights defined as those above the 45 degree line from the horizon at the response location. And finally, relatively important flights defined as flight events contributing up to one decibel of the total DNL at the response location. The analyses investigated whether after controlling for DNL, the factors were related to the overall level of aircraft noise annoyance or moderate the relationship between annoyance and noise exposure as measured by DNL. Among these factors, only noticeable exhibited a marginally statistically significant ability to explain differences, while the remainder exhibited no statistical relationship. We also examined the data from the phone survey administered to households who had completed the mail survey. The phone survey was designed to obtain further information about attitudes toward airports and airport policies, and to explore additional factors that may explain variance and annoyance to aircraft noise. As noted earlier, these questions could not be asked in the mail survey without disclosing the true purpose of the data collection, which could have biased the aircraft noise ratings. The phone survey asked detailed questions concerning respondents' opinions on noise, experiences with aircraft noise, relationship to the airport, concerns about aircraft operations, and views on airport community relations. Of the more than 10,000 mail survey respondents, just over 2,000 elected to participate in the phone survey. The phone survey data was not included in the national dose response curve because these households were already included from their mail survey. A variety of analyses were carried out on the phone survey data and are covered in Appendix D of the report. Out of nearly 90 analytic variables captured in the phone survey, the analyses conducted to date have shown that people's degree of being highly annoyed by aircraft noise is best correlated to the reports of being startled, frightened, and or awakened by aircraft noise. The specific questions that taken together are best correlated with being highly annoyed are shown here. Thank you for listening. Don Scotta from FAA will now provide some concluding remarks before we move to the questions and answers period. Okay, so thank you, Eric. What did the, the next thing we wanna talk about is what do these results mean? The results of the Neighborhood Environmental Survey show a substantial increase in the level of annoyance to aircraft noise relative to past surveys. Multiple factors may be driving these changes, and public input is requested to inform our next steps. Public and stakeholder feedback on these and other factors will be critical for, to inform FAA's understanding of the survey results. And taken together with the rest of FAA's noise research program, FAA is seeking to establish a national dialogue on aircraft noise issues. So the graphic on the right shares some of the possible factors driving change, such as population distribution around airports, changes in aircraft noise characteristics and operations, how people live and work, and the overall societal response to noise, and also how the survey methodology updates and improvements compared to previous surveys may affect change in the results. So looking forward, how will FAA use the findings of the survey? The Neighborhood Environmental Survey provides data that quantitatively shows that substantially more people are highly annoyed by aircraft noise exposure than in the past. We will look at the NES findings alongside outputs from other noise research programs and inputs from public and stakeholder comment to inform future actions. Our ongoing research to understand the potential impacts to sleep and cardiovascular health should be particularly insightful. The results of the survey are an important element of a broader portfolio of research and community engagement to investigate and mitigate the impacts of aircraft noise. The FAA intends to continue reviewing these first research findings in combination with public and stakeholder feedback to inform research and policy priorities. As far as next steps, we, publishing the Federal Register Notice was a key first step towards engaging in a conversation with aviation stakeholders about FAA noise policy. FAA is encouraging the public and stakeholders to review the notice and survey report and provide constructive comments. Please note that the notice and survey report provide data that will be used in the upcoming discussion about policy, but is not policy in itself. As far as timeline, as we've mentioned already, we're in the middle of a 60-day comment period on the Federal Register Notice. At the end of that period, we will review public comments and identify general themes. 
we're concurrently identifying next steps beyond the notice and plan to engage with stakeholders as we move forward. We also intend to keep the public and stakeholders up to date as we make progress. The notice invites public comment on FAA's noise research program, including the survey. Below are three questions that we're focused on uh, and would like feedback on in particular. Factors that may be contributing to the increase in noise shown in the survey results, additional investigation or analysis on the effects of aircraft noise on individuals and communities, noise modeling metric and environmental data visualization, and reduction, abatement, and mitigation of aircraft noise, and also additional categories of investigation, analysis, or research that should be undertaken to inform FA noise policy. To help provide additional information on aircraft noise, a detailed overview of the methodology and results of the NES are available on our website, fa.gov slash go slash aviation noise. If you have any technical questions about the survey or the Federal Register notice, you can email us at noiseresearchfrn at fa.gov. If you'd like to make a formal comment on the survey or the Federal Register notice, you can do so using the regulations.gov docket. To get there, go to fa.gov slash go slash aviation noise and click the provide your comments link in the blue box at the top of the page. That will take you to the Federal Register notice where you can find a green box allowing you to submit a formal comment. When you click the green box, a form will, will be shown that you can use to submit your comments. We will now open the question and answer part of our web webinar. We are also recording the webinar and it will be posted at fa.gov slash go slash aviation noise and on FAA's YouTube channel. Questions and comments made during this webinar on FAA's noise research programs and neighborhood environmental survey will not be recorded to the federal docket. To make an official comment, a link to the Federal Register Notice is available at fa.gov slash go slash aviation noise. The comment period opened on January 13th for 60 days. During the webinar, you may submit questions by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of the Zoom window. A window will open and you may enter your question. People who are watching the workshop on FAA's YouTube or Facebook pages may enter comments in the chat areas or comment boxes. We will answer as many questions as time allows that pertain to the noise research and survey. Questions that are repetitive may not be answered. We are unable to answer questions about any other topic during the webinar. Thank you. Hello, everyone, um, and thank you again for joining our Noise Research and Neighborhood Environmental Survey webinar. Uh, we're going to begin the, the live session with a live question and answer. Um, my name again is Jim Heilman, and as I noted at the outset of the briefings, I'm the FAA's Chief Scientific and Technical Advisor for Environment and Energy, and I'll be the moderator for our panel tonight. Um, I'd like to reintroduce you to those you just heard from. Um, now they're live. Um, I'm pleased to be joined by Don Scotta, the Noise Division Manager for the FAA Office of Environment and Energy, Joe Check, Principal Consultant at HMMH, and Eric Jotz, Associate Director at Westat. Um, as Don just noted, um, during the Q&A session, you may submit questions by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of the Zoom window. A lot of people have been doing this successfully. Um, and so we're glad to, to see that and to see all the questions coming in. Um, I'll start by noting that we've received multiple questions concerning whether the webinar um, will be recorded and made available on the FAA website. Um, it will be the website, Don noted, faa.gov slash go slash aviation noise. We will also make the presentation available. Um, we noted a couple of people expressing concerns about uh, the fidelity of it, and that's because those were pre-recorded. Um, so these will all be made available online. All right. Um, so with that, we will go to our first question. Um, so Don, this question is for you. Why did the FAA conduct the Neighborhood Environmental Survey? Thanks, Jim. As a part of our ongoing efforts to address aircraft noise, we conducted the survey to determine if there's been a change in the way people perceive aircraft noise and to help inform ongoing research and policy priorities. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, 
question too. Oh, this one's also for you, Don. Um, why is the FAA publishing the results of the 2017 survey now? Well, the, the 2018 FAA Reauthorization Act directed FAA to report the findings of the survey by October 2020. Uh, which was our target. And while we ended up releasing the survey a little later than anticipated, um, we were very happy that it's out at this point and we're receiving comments. Excellent. Um, third question, uh, Don, um, are there changes in flight patterns and timing resulting from RNAV, one of the factors being examined with respect to increasing annoyance? So the NES was designed to quantify the annoyance resulting from a range of DNL aircraft noise exposures. While the survey didn't specifically look at how the introduction of performance-based navigation or PBN correlates to annoyance, any changes in noise resulting from airspace changes would be captured through the survey responses. We're encouraging stakeholders to submit comments to the federal docket regarding how the survey could be used to consider concerns related to next gen. Thanks, Don. Um, I guess I'll take the fourth question here. Um, how is FAA communicating with interested groups? Is FAA holding webinars at airports across the country? Um, so we're hosting this webinar to provide an opportunity for a wide range of people to learn more about the agency's noise research program, as well as the neighborhood environmental survey. Um, on request, we've also been providing briefings to airport roundtables and other interested stakeholders around the country. I know a number of people from uh, FAA have been doing that. Um, in addition um, to this, the FAA also actively participates in community airport roundtables around the country and through our regional community engagement officers. <clears throat> okay, let's see what we have. Uh, next question will be for you, Joe. Um, does this just focus on large airports, this being the survey? Um, does the survey just focus on large airports? Can you please answer this question? Thank you. Sure, thanks, Jim. Uh, no, it does not just focus on large airports. Uh, as I mentioned during my part of the brief, uh, we used a rigorous statistical process to identify a cross-section of airports to best represent the nation as a whole. And in order to have a chance for selection, the airports need to have at least 100 average daily jet operations as shown by FAA's data. That's their traffic flow management system counts for 2011, plus have at least 100 people exposed to DNL greater than or equal to 65 decibels, as well as 100 people between 60 and 65 decibels. And the process used for this selection is described in detail in chapter three of the report. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, got another one here for you, Joe. Um, what about helicopters and other rotorcraft? Are they included in any of the historical data sets mentioned in the opening presentation? Yes, indeed. Uh, yes, they are. Uh, we included the modeling of helicopters where applicable, uh, where we uh, had Air, you know, had those types of uh, vehicles present in the radar flight tracking data. Um, there were some instances, of course, where uh, the airports that we chose did not have any helicopters operating. Thanks, Joe. You were faster than I expected. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Don, this one's um, a bit longer. Um, so, with respect to the survey, can the FAA make data available to the public or perform um, one of the following, use the existing NES data to determine the independent effect of non-DNL noise metrics. For example, number above 50 on the proportion of individuals who are highly annoyed. Uh, the analyses must use logistic statistical models with and without random effects as were used in the NES study and should report the parameter estimates and confidence intervals as well as model fit statistics by airport and for all airports combined. Yeah, those, those are good suggestions. Uh, we'd encourage stakeholders or, or the public to submit comments to the federal docket on what other noise research priorities that we should consider 
um, and how we could use the survey da data to evaluate other things such as supplemental noise metrics, uh, the ones that were mentioned in the question. Public comment on the NES methodology and the statistical methods used are also welcome. Yeah, I, I would um, definitely second what Don said there. If you have good ideas for how we could use this data, that's why we have the FRN out there, make us all smarter. Um, Joe, I've got one for you um, here. Um, you seem to be addressing homes that are close to the airport and not the communities that are a distance from the airport, but under the next gen path. Um, yeah, I would say that that's probably uh, not totally true. The NES considers communities exposed to DNL aircraft noise levels between 50 decibels and 75 decibels, uh, which is both uh, near and far. Uh, and so that is going to be able to include communities which are um, a range of distances from the airport. Okay. Uh, another one for you, Joe. Um, what is the FAA's definition of DNL 65 dB? Well, again, as I uh, said in my brief, I didn't want to go through the mathematical explanation, so I'll still save that uh, for another time. But basically, you know, DNL is a cumulative noise exposure uh, with 10 decibels added to nighttime noise, noise events. And the FAA considers a threshold of DNL 65 decibels uh, to be the threshold for residential land use compatibility. Uh, that's about all I can say on that topic without going into a lot of further detail. Okay. Um, I would note that uh, on our website, faa.gov slash aviation noise, we, we have some additional information about uh, um, DNL and uh, the 65 number. Um, Eric, we finally have one for you. Um, were economic or other equities evaluated or determined by the household responses? For example, did you evaluate the responses from financially disparaged areas to determine if you obtain sufficient data from these areas that usually have lower response rates? Thanks, Jim. Uh, environmental justice was not considered as a component of the survey design. However, race and ethnicity and community poverty estimates were assessed as potential factors which could explain differences in the annoyance response. After a careful statistical assessment, these factors were actually determined to have no st statistical relationship to aircraft noise annoyance. Okay, thanks Eric. Um, got another one for you. Um, how does the FAA explain the reduced response rate from those um, experiencing increased DNL levels, which may appear counterintuitive? Sure. Um, we don't actually know know the, you know, what happened there. My uh, suspicion is that those homes closer to the airport with the higher DNL values uh, were more likely to be vacant, um, and or um, just uh, you know there were the the people living there were were different in some way um, that affected their response to the survey. Okay, thanks. And just so everyone is aware, I, I'm reading a lot of these questions as they're coming in. Um, and so they, they may say to FAA, but I'm directing them to the research team who, who did the work as well. Um, all right, uh, Joe, um, got one for you. Have you calculated DNL values for the NES data using the version of INM used for the 1992 analysis? And if so, were the regression parameter estimates similar to what is reported in the NES technical report. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Uh, the NES project utilized INM version 7.0D. Uh, the Schultz or FICON curve is based on a combination of multiple surveys, each with different methodologies. So, you know, including different sources for the aircraft noise data. So conducting a direct comparison in that regard is, is therefore not possible. Thanks, Joe. Um, I'll be taking this one. What is the timing for the completion of the health and human impacts research? How will the results combine with the findings of the NES research help formulate future FAA noise policy? 
Um, so this is work that is ongoing. There, there's efforts ongoing um, at UPenn on sleep and BU on cardiovascular health, um, but it'll be several years before these programs um, are completed. Uh, the sleep study is going to take a bit longer than the cardiovascular work. Um, but as the researchers are making progress, they're publishing their work in peer-reviewed journals. Um, these are going on to the, uh, the Ascent website. Um, we're doing um, our best to ensure that the researchers make their work available to the public. Um, and so as we get those research results, um, even before the, you know, the final, as these publications are published, um, we in the FAA will look at the, the findings and as appropriate, use them to inform um, our noise priorities, our future research, as well as our noise policy. Okay, I've got another one for me. Um, which stakeholders is the FAA working with to address aviation noise concerns? Um, we recognize, and we've noticed with, um, uh, before, we recognize that aircraft noise is a, a national issue requiring um, involvement from um, many perspectives for many different entities. Um, so feedback on FAA's noise research and policy um, policies can come from community roundtables, elected officials, airport sponsors, as well as airlines are all critical to informing potential opportunities um, to address aircraft noise concerns. Um, while also uh, maintaining a safe and efficient national airspace. And I would note with this uh, Federal Register notice, there's an opportunity for anyone um, to comment on what we're doing and, and give us feedback. Um, so hopefully you'll take advantage of that. <clears throat> Let's see here. Um, Don, the next question is for you. Um, will the FAA formally address comments and questions it receives during the comment period? So uh, we intend to review all of the comments received during the comment period, and we'll take them into account during our review. Uh, since, since you mentioned comments, I think it's worth noting that the questions and comments that we're receiving tonight during this webinar are not going to be recorded to the federal docket. Uh, if you'd like to make an official comment, you can link, find a link to the Federal Register notice on our website, fa.gov slash go slash aviation noise. And as another reminder, the comment period opened on January 13th of 2021, and it's open for 60 days. All right, um, got one for me. Uh oh, they're coming in fast enough. I have to, to scroll back up my list. Pardon that. Um, <clears throat> all right, um, a logical follow on question. What happens after the comment period ends? Um, I guess I'll take that one. Uh, once the comment period ends, the FAA will review all of the comments that we've received um, through the federal docket and identify the themes um, and recommendations from them. A uh, summary of this feedback will then be used to inform um, the agency's next steps for informing noise research priorities and considerations um, on noise policies. Uh, Joe, the next one is for you. Uh, did FAA study how aircraft noise annoyance compared to annoyance from other sources? Yeah, uh, well, the survey did ask respondents to rate how, how annoyed they were from road vehicle noise, uh, as Eric pointed out uh, in, his, in his part of the webinar. The study did not assess noise from non-aircraft sources. And the dose response relationship that was built was only presented for aircraft noise annoyance. Thanks, Joe. Um, got one here for you, Eric. Uh, the report highlights from the phone survey data that highly annoyed residents are impacted by the belief that the airport is not working collaboratively with them. Was there a review of specific airport activities that were occurring during the time of the survey that could have impacted the results? Sure, um, out of the approximately 90 variables included on the phone survey, the most correlated reason for being highly annoyed from aircraft noise was when respondents said they were startled, frightened, or awakened, and, and I covered that in the, the slides. The phone survey also asked about respondents' uh, views on other um, items such as the relationship um, with, with the uh, airports 
but that uh, was not conclusive. And further review on this topic may be warranted and comments to the docket on this subject are encouraged. Thanks, Eric. Um, okay, uh, Don, for you, one, uh, one for you. The FAA only seems concerned about aircraft sound levels. You have yet to address the particular sound quality of helicopters that fly over residential neighborhoods, not just to and from airports. Um, so, well, that couldn't be further from the truth. We, we do uh, care about the noise that's created by helicopters and have an active research program looking into that right now. Uh, more information about the research we're doing on helicopters can be found looking at our website uh, or uh, the, our Center of Excellence's website, the Ascent Center of Excellence, which is ascent.aero, A-E-R-O. Um, and we're also working with Helicopters uh, International on a program called Fly Neighborly, which can be used by helicopter operators to show them ways to operate their helicopters with a with lower the potential of impact uh, of noise on communities underneath their operations. Thanks, Don. I, I would note that that is uh, Ascent Project 38. Um, and uh, um, there's also, this is mentioned, was mentioned in my briefing as well as in the FRN. Um, all right. Uh, okay, for you, Eric. Um, what is the average percentage of total survey responses um, that were returned? Um, the response rate was approximately 40%, um, which was as predicted uh, based on our ACRP study. Okay. Okay, got another one for you, Eric. Is there a reason why the collected data was treated as binary, i.e. yes, no, instead of using the one to five annoyance values in order to conduct statistical modeling? Sure. Uh, so in order to be consistent with past uh, dose response um, uh, curves, uh, you know, we use logistic regression modeling and that requires uh, uh, binary so we can determine the percent highly annoyed. So the percent highly annoyed is either you are highly annoyed, um, in this case a one, or you're not highly annoyed, which is zero. Um, and, and so you have to convert that one device scale to, to a, a, a zero one um, a value. And uh, for folks who are really interested in digging deep into that uh, statistical analysis, I believe that's covered in chapter eight of the report. Thanks, Eric. Um, okay, Don, got one for you. Um, are new noise equity metrics being investigated? Uh, yeah, so we've fought, sponsored research to review and consider the use of supplemental noise metrics in addition to DNL, which might be useful in further informing changes resulting from proposed federal actions. We published a report to Congress this last summer detailing the applicable supplemental metrics for consideration of aircraft noise uh, as well. Thanks, Don. Uh, Joe, one for you. Um, were those surveyed just within the 65 CNEL slash DNL or greater? Uh, no, short answer is no. Uh, the survey was designed to ensure sampling in five decibel bands between DNL 50 uh, and 75 decibels around each airport. Uh, this provided for the required distribution and noise exposure levels to create the, the national dose response curve. So we looked at uh, surveyed people not only within the 65, but also outside of the 65, all the way down to the 50. All right. <clears throat> oh, sorry, losing my voice. Um, Joe, I've got one for you and I'm, I'm gonna break the question apart. Um, uh, so for you, Joe, um, even though the study was just released, the data is several years old. Is the data still valid? Yes, you bet. Uh, it's the most contemporary study available. Uh, so it is, it is still valid in a lot of ways. Thanks. I, I would also note that it, it um, has similar values to um, recent data from Europe, recent similar studies. Um, there's a second question of that one. Does the FAA have a plan for an updated survey um, in the near future? 
Um, the, at present, uh, I'll take that one. At present, the answer to that is no, but um, we um, would, could reevaluate this if people think it's needed. Um, that's why we have the FRN open, but in, in the very near term, the answer is no. Okay. Um, this one's for you, Don. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I managed to have the question broken up and I answered it for you while well, it happens. Um, you guys are answering these things too fast. <laughs> sorry about that. No, 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 no. I, I generally appreciate people being highly efficient. Um, okay. Eric, um, have the highway noise annoyance findings been an analyzed? Uh, well, we did ask respondents to read how they were annoyed from road vehicle noise, among other sources. Um, we did not assess noise from the non-aircraft uh, sources. Uh, we don't have a dose, essentially, for those other, uh, other factors. We don't know uh, what that road noise level is at each of the respondents' uh, homes. And so, therefore, a dose-response relationship was only presented for aircraft noise. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Um, Don, um, does FAA have plans to resample any communities to update the data and capture noise annoyance associated with changes implemented in the fall of 2015? Some airport communities experienced heightened noise annoyance in that period. So um, right now we don't have any plans to conduct a new aircraft noise annoyance study or resample communities uh, at this time, but our, we'll seek to use those results or these results to explore a range of potential research questions to better address noise concerns. We're interested in getting your feedback um, through the Federal Register notice, uh, the official docket, um, but right now we're really focused on ways that we can use this survey that we've just completed or been able to release the results of before we we look at doing any additional surveys. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I've got one for you here, Joe. Um, military aircraft have unique noise profiles and can be more annoying than commercial aircraft. How many of the airports sampled in the survey included military aircraft? Um, Jim, I, several, uh, several of the sampled airports uh, had military operations. I can think of at least two or three. The, the one that sticks out in my mind is Tucson. Um, and a complete list of, of aircraft operations is uh, broken out by aircraft category and Appendix F, that's Appendix Foxtrot of uh, the report. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, got one for me. Um, thank you for doing the study and for taking comments via the Federal Register. Once the comment period is over, what is the time frame for review and policy changes to address the annoyance that neighborhoods are experiencing since the RNAV changes? Um, our immediate focus here is on receiving and reviewing the public comments. Um, this will help us inform areas of, of further investigation and then help us develop the next steps for the review. Um, so I, I really can't give a, a firm time frame, um, but we, we intend to move promptly. Uh, next question seems also is for me. Um, great job and interesting to hear the results. Uh, any thoughts on emerging aircraft technologies? Um, for example, is FAA contemplating how to evaluate perceptions around electric aircraft, supersonic aircraft, and other new aircraft technologies? Um, excellent question. Um, so the, the survey itself is obviously um, based around the air vehicles that were in operation while the survey was taking place. And there's been a lot of um, um, moves by the industry um, to, to think about new air vehicles that could enter the national airspace. Um, so we've been working very closely um, with uh, researchers at NASA to, to understand the types of noise that could come from electric aircraft, such as advanced air mobility vehicles, and to really understand those. Um, and uh, 
and you were taking some of the lessons learned from the survey here to think about how we could understand perceptions to that noise. Um, and this would have to be done on small studies as there aren't many of these vehicles operating. Um, and uh, with respect to supersonic aircraft, um, NASA has been um, for several years now developing a low boom flight demonstrator, the X-59. And the, their intent of developing this aircraft is to, to generate I have an aircraft fly supersonically and generate a, a, uh, a, a noise. It's not quite a boom, but it will make a noise as it has exceeded the, the speed of sound. Um, and they are developing this to, to capture um, how communities feel about the noise levels. And they'll try several different um, boom levels. And they're also using um, the, the lessons from this study and the research team and, and our collective knowledge to inform the development of the, the survey for that. So thank you for that question. Um, okay, uh, Joe, this next one's for you. Um, are the DNL estimates from the INM AADT software that was used for the NES study more precise than the ones used in the 1992 high annoyance model? Well, certainly <clears throat> the noise modeling inputs used for the NES relied on the most uh, up-to-date tool at the time, which uh, was the INM, the Integrated Noise Model. And uh, it was version 7.0D of that model um, versus the models that existed 30 years ago when the FICON uh, curve was released. Um, and our the NES survey included nearly a year's worth of flight tracking data uh, to, to base the results on. Uh, and that meant more detailed inputs uh, regarding aircraft performance characteristics, uh, certainly then were available uh, during the early 90s or even late 70s when the Schultz curve uh, originated. Thanks, Joe. Uh, I guess this next one's for me. Is FAA anticipating any congressional action in response to the survey? Uh, if so, what specific elements uh, might be their focus? Uh, I guess I get the fun ones. Um, I, I'm sorry, I honestly don't know. Um, we have informed several members of Congress about the survey. Um, there was a letter that went to the Quiet Skies Caucus and there's obviously considerable interest in aviation noise with some members of Congress. Um, however, it's just really hard to know what will come out of that interest and, and where it will go. Um, I, just because I live in Washington doesn't give me great insight into what happens up on the Hill. Um, Don, this next one's for you. Um, how do you see roundtables getting involved and does that include maybe using the survey in our local areas that weren't included in uh, chosen airports? Well, the, the first way I think that roundtables can get involved is to review the report and submit comments uh, on behalf of the roundtable or to encourage individual members or your local community members to read the report, review our, the information that we published on our website and share your thoughts uh, on, on what we've done and whether there's any additional work that's needed. Um, in addition, we're what we welcome input on how you all uh, roundtables could stay involved in this process and how that any ways that they roundtables think we could work with them as we conduct our review. Thanks, Don. Um, Eric, um, got another one for you. Did the survey also show comparative annoyance levels to other environmental concerns? Sure. Um, so we had the, the 13 uh, neighborhood uh, environmental factors that we asked folks to rate their annoyance level with, um, one of which was, of course, aircraft noise. Another was highway noise, which um, was the subject of an earlier question. Um, and we did, uh, you know, I guess we don't have dose for any of the other ones other than aircraft noise, but we did uh, analyze the average annoyance level across all of those environmental factors. And uh, at least for our survey respondents, the aircraft noise was considerably higher um, than the others. And we have a figure in Appendix B of the report uh, that shows the um, 
uh, average uh, noise level across those 13 metrics um, for both the male and the telephone survey. I, just for the male survey, uh, I'm showing that earlier in the presentation as well. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Don, one for you. Uh, with the increasing number of citizens working from home, spending most of their time at home, uh, present company included, I'd expect an increasing number of complaints. Uh, there should be a COVID associated bias on any survey conducted now. Uh, can you respond to that, please? That's an interesting suggestion. I think um, the, the connection to the, the research that we're talking about is that our, our survey was conducted back in 2015, which as well before uh, any of us were experiencing the, the impacts from COVID. Um, but if there's, if there's things that any of you think we should be looking into uh, or research ideas, uh, we certainly would welcome them and you can submit them uh, into the docket on the Federal Register. Thanks, Don. Um, this one's for me, but if anybody else wants to chime in, you should definitely feel free to. Um, <clears throat> how many more years before quieter electric engines are a viable reality? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, it's just so people understand, I, I'm a chief scientist. I work a lot on technology, work very closely with NASA. Um, we don't expect battery powered single aisle or larger aircraft anytime in the foreseeable future. We, to have that happen, you would need a, uh, a, uh, you'd need a miracle in battery technology. Um, but with that said, it, it's an interesting thought exercise and there are smaller air vehicles that could operate potentially on batteries. Um, so um, <clears throat> the, the, the thing I would ask you to think about is that, okay, so let's say you got rid of the jet engine. Um, you still have an aircraft moving through the air, it makes noise, it saws landing gear, that makes noise. You still have a fan on the front of the engine that has to move the air, that makes noise the air leaving the back of whatever it is, it's no longer you know, a jet engine, but it's something that also makes noise. Um, and depending on how the air vehicle is designed, you could end up with, if it's got vertical lift capabilities, you could end up with the fans um, creating tones that interact in, in different ways. Um, so I, while these, an, air ve an electric air vehicle or an all electric air vehicle could be quieter than a jet powered aircraft, it's not gonna be silent. You could probably, you'd probably still hear it. Um, and so then this is, you know, it's needed and we need to um, do everything we can to reduce noise. Um, but it's where we don't see a, you know, electric aircraft being a magic silver bullet that would um, solve the, the noise problem. Uh, the other thing I would note is, um, as I said at the outset, today's aircraft, um, you would need 10 to 30 of those operations to get to the same noise level as an aircraft in the 1970s. Um, so with that lesson learned, we, we also need to be thinking not only about reduction at the source, but other things. And we're very interested in, in hearing people's thoughts on that through the FRN. I don't know if uh, anyone else wants to add anything to that. Uh, yeah, Jim, I'll just mention that uh, we've been tracking uh, NASA as well and the urban air mobility field, and, and we, we definitely see that electric vehicles and that sort of thing is, is on its way up. There's a lot of manufacturers already that are trying to build viable uh, aircraft. So um, definitely see it in the future for smaller vehicles, and like you said, uh, maybe not foreseeable for big, big commercial airliners yet, but... Um, Maybe someday uh, it will be. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Joe. Um, all right, Don, got one for you. When will the FAA begin using the new national dose response curve for annoyance? Well, that, that's the question, I think. Um, and, and as I mentioned in my slides, we, we're working on uh, a review of our policy or will will once this comment period ends. Uh, and, you know, as much as this is an important uh, body of research and these results are incredibly important uh, as an input into the dialogue that we need to have on this topic, 
they're just one input into that process. So, you know, there's not, there's not really a way that we could say we're going to use this to, to change policy all by itself, but it certainly is an important input into a dialogue that, that is starting now uh, on this important topic for about aviation noise and, and how, we're, how we're addressing it. Thanks, Don. Got another one for you. Um, does the FAA have plans for further research into the contributing factors, in other words, sources and conditions driving um, high DNL and annoyance levels, as well as the development of appropriate solutions for lowering the levels? Is the FAA expecting input regarding the contributing factors and potential solutions from the Federal Register comments? So, I mean, we have, we have a lot of different ongoing research projects. Right, right now, there's nothing specifically that, that I'm aware of or that's coming to mind at least quickly um, into the contributing factors um, that, that were highlighted in the presentation, but um, we certainly are welcome. We welcome input regarding these, the, you know, the factors that I mentioned in the slides, as well as any other potential factors uh, that the, the public is aware of or, or thinks might be causing an increase in annoyance. And we also welcome uh, ideas on other potential solutions. We have a lot of very smart people focused on it, trying to answer these questions. Uh, it's a very, very difficult question and a very, uh, to answer a very difficult problem to solve. So any input um, that anyone can provide us into that, into that discussion is, is welcome. Yeah, and I, I would note building on what Don said, um, we, we've, we continue to fund research to look at operational procedures that could reduce noise. We've been working in close collaboration with MIT um, and Massport to try to identify different opportunities for noise reduction, um, working um, to get uh, lower, quieter aircraft developed and into the fleet through our CLEAN program. We work very closely with NASA I'm encouraging them to develop uh, technologies for quiet aircraft as well. Um, so if there are other things that we should be doing or could be doing that people can think of, uh, the FRN's a great way to let us know. <clears throat> All right, um, question for me. Um, what is a funding mechanism for university? Do you fund universities for basic or applied research for aircraft noise? Do you regularly open calls for universities to submit proposals? Yeah, that's definitely for me. Um, <clears throat> so we have the Ascent um, Center of Excellence um, for University Research. It's the Aviation Sustainability Center co-led by MIT and Washington State. Um, it follows in the, the work that Partner did um, from 2004 to 2015. So we've been working with universities for a number of years now. Um, and the FAA, our, um, um, our R&D mission is to fund applied research. Um, we can use um, a small fraction of our funds for basic research, but basic research in aeronautics is the domain of NASA. Um, we work on the applied research. Um, and so we fund at the Ascent Universities through um, our research engineering development funds. Um, to do a number of different studies, such as the ones you've heard about here, as well as other work um, on procedures, aircraft technology, understanding noise impacts, the, the full range. You can learn more about that by going to the Ascent website, um, ascent.aero. Um, and so the research of Ascent um, needs to go through one of the 16 Ascent schools. Um, we do a lot work with a large number of those of universities with respect to noise. Um, and we do um, from time to time open calls for universities to submit proposals. We actually do do that. Um, it's a, a process wherein I, um, as the uh, program manager for that COE, will send out a solicitation and seek ideas. Um, but I also have an open call to all of the universities um, to share any good ideas they have. Um, and with this FRN, if people can think of good ideas for university research, it's a good way for people to, to share that as well. We'll be getting those inputs as well. Okay. Um, let's see here. 
Um, Don, the next question is for you. Is it possible to review the specific airport results from the NES from the survey? Yes, uh, we've, we've obviously been focused on looking at the national curve and sharing those results because that's the reason we, we undertook this, this research. Um, however, as a, as a part of that process and coming up with the national curve, we did develop individual dose response curves for each of the 20 airports that were surveyed. Uh, that information can be found in the survey report, and um, that is in Appendix I. So it's it's towards the end of, of the report in Appendix I where that information can be found. Anything you want to add to that, Joe? No, I was uh, shaking my head because I was definitely agreeing that Appendix I is, is the place to go. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I, I would note that with the, the overall survey, um, my, my hat goes off to the research team. They, they've compiled... Um, a very comprehensive study that um, has a large number of appendices, a tremendous amount of data. Um, we developed the aviation noise website um, and, and a specific page on the survey to try to up-level that information because there are a lot of people who are interested or concerned or really you know, care deeply about aircraft noise. Um, and we don't expect you to have to go through a 500 page report to learn about it. That's why we put together the website. Um, but at the same time, um, it's critical that the deep scientific knowledge be shared with the, the public, and that's in this very lengthy report. Yeah, um, and Jim, I wanted to add yes. uh, to that, too, that in, uh, although Appendix I has individual curves for each airport, uh, those are assembled and compared in Chapter 8 uh, of the report. Good. You don't have to read all the way to Appendix I to get to that information. Thanks, Joe. Um, all right. Um, there's a question for all of us. Um, will there be considerations and follow-on studies for normalizing slash adapting the findings for a work from home, learn from home environment that may be a reality for the next several years? Um, maybe we'll start with Don on this and then go to Joe and Eric. Well, I, I certainly think um, that's that sounds like a good comment or suggestion to make to the Federal Register uh, or to the docket. I think we, we don't have any immediate plans right now, but if if there's a, a research um, question that, that we could see the value in, in investigating, uh, given the current circumstances, that would be the place to, to pose the question to us so we could consider it. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add that uh, from the technical point of view, it, it does seem a challenge because um, you're talking about an indoor environment uh, and that's going to be a little different to handle and to estimate than the outdoor environment that we have from aircraft noise uh, that, that the NES dealt with. Indeed. Yeah, but it's definitely our reality right now and, and we'll see for how this changes things. Um, all right, Eric, um, we have one for you. Uh, the follow-up phone survey indicated that many people annoyed with aircraft noise noted non-acoustic factors as causing their concern. For example, smells, fears, et cetera. To what degree is noise annoyance a proxy for multiple airport environmental impacts? Uh, might, this at, might this be at least a partial explanation for the increases and reported noise annoyance, even as aircraft noise levels have been declining over the years? Thanks, Jim. Um, that's a really good question and uh, something I think, you know, that we can continue to dig into further. Um, out of the approximately 90 variables included on the phone surveys, we've noted um, earlier this evening, the most correlated reason for being highly annoyed from aircraft noise was when respondents said they were startled, frightened, or awakened by aircraft noise. Um, that you know seems to me kind of common sense. There are other things, um, you know, that could be contributing to that. We've uh, reviewed a number of them um, and and found some things that you know are um, do do not seem to be um, worth further review. Um, but you know we continue to consider other factors contributing to aircraft noise annoyance. Um, that includes a further review of the phone survey responses. Um, certainly, if uh, the public has ideas um, about things that maybe uh, 
contributing to that, and we would welcome those comments, um, you know, on the FAA's noise research program and the survey, um, and you could submit those to the Federal Register notice, um, and we'd be happy to dig into them further. Thanks, Eric. Um, Joe, the next one's for you. How does the NES national curve compare to the ISO standard? In, um, in chapter eight of the report, we compare the national curve to uh, basically two other sets of curves, uh, three, X, three actually. Uh, one is the uh, International uh, Standards Organization ISO curve from 2016. And, this, and another one is the TNO curve, which is the um, Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific Research. And their uh, study came out in the uh, 2011 and 2016 periods. These studies utilize responses over a multi-decade period though, um, and they show substantially less annoyance than that predicted by the national curve. Um, and then the other curve, of course, in chapter eight was the comparison to the FICON uh, curve, which also showed that the, um, there is much less annoyance then than there is now. So it, uh, we do compare those curves, it's in chapter eight, and I refer the uh, audience to that. Thanks, Joe. I've got another one for you. How does the FAA respond, to, uh, I'm sorry, how would you respond to those communities who feel that they are severely impacted by noise but their local airport was not included in the NES study. Boston, Phoenix, San Francisco, DC metro area, and Seattle are not included in the list and have experienced noise issues. Yeah, well, as I covered in some of my webinar, we, we went through a pretty rigorous process to um, balance the sampling of airports. It's called balanced sampling. And, um, so unfortunately, we could not include all the airports uh, because of various reasons, uh, time and money and things like that. Uh, but we had to select from those a, a balanced sample based on factors. And those factors are described in the report as well. Um, even though a community's airport was not selected to be part of the survey, the survey was designed to collectively represent though all the nation's airport communities and uh, mixed, you know, the question made specific mention of a few airports like Boston. We couldn't include Boston in the NES because it was already included in the ACRP study. Um, airports, another one that was mentioned in the question there was Seattle that caught my ear. Um, Seattle was not, uh, the people around Seattle were not um, included in the survey, but the noise from uh, Seattle Tacoma's uh, air, airport aircraft operations were actually included in the dose for the people around Boeing Field, uh, just north of Seattle. Uh, that was the one case, and that's included in the report. That's all mentioned in the report. Uh, that was the one case of all the 20 airports in which there was a airport in proximity to another that um, required us to model the operations from that close airport. Thanks, Joe. Uh, next question is for me. Will the FAA study the reasons why the public is more annoyed with aircraft noise when the data clearly shows that aircraft noise has decreased significantly over the last few decades? Um, so the, the, this is an interesting question and we are trying to get a better handle on it. But the, the issue is not that the data clearly show that aircraft noise has decreased. It's Aircraft, the, the noise from any individual aircraft has most certainly decreased dramatically over the past decades. And the number of people exposed to noise has also decreased considerably um, since 1970 to now. Um, however, as I noticed at the out, noted at the outset, the noise experience is different. Um, and this is something that we, we're working hard to better understand. Um, and the survey captures uh, some of uh, of our work on this front. Um, and we are um, racking our heads thinking about ways to better understand this and get to the core of it. And if you or anyone else have ideas to help us, um, please submit them to the docket. Um, that's why we're doing this, to get your feedback 
we have a lot of ideas, but we're not all the ideas. Um, so please share your views on maybe the types of things we could study. Um, and we look forward to hearing those. I, I don't know if, um, if uh, Don, Joe, Eric, any of you want to um, comment on that or not. No need to, let's just check. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I think there are, uh, there are a lot of uh, potential reasons why. I mean, you know, and, and as you've covered, uh, Jim and others, the, you know, the nature of the aircraft uh, operations have changed, you know, more uh, quieter planes, it could be a frequency issue. It could also just be that uh, society has changed too and, and are more sensitive um, to, to noise than they were in the past. Um, uh, you know, other living conditions have improved and, um, you know, when, uh, when you have um, fewer concerns in life, perhaps you focus on, on more on some of the things that haven't changed. Thanks, Eric. Um, we'll keep working through questions. Um, Don, um, question for you. Is the FAA currently collecting data on the noise levels around airports? So I'll, I'll interpret that question uh, asking more about whether we're modeling uh, noise exposure around airports. And, and the answer to that is yes, we are. Uh, we do what we call an annual inventory uh, where we, we look at um, the, the entire national airspace system and model the year-to-year -year changes to the number of people exposed by significant aircraft noise or basically DNL 65 decibels or greater. Uh, that's, that's the source of the information in one of Jim's first slides showing the reduction in, um, in noise exposure uh, to people at the significant level of 65 DNL or higher. Thanks, Don. Um, I, I just wanted to note that we're down to 10 minutes left on the webinar, and we've gotten a ton of great questions. Um, and I don't think we're going to be able to get through them all. It, it's, um, we have a great team working through them to help us with them. Um, but I just want to encourage you know, everyone to make sure um, that you submit your, your comments to the Federal Register. Um, that's primarily why we're here, but we're also going to work through questions, and I'll remind this at the end. Um, so a uh, question for you, Don, um, how can um, someone contact uh, the com regional community engagement officer to host a, a meeting in their rural community? So with, without knowing exactly where this person's from, I could direct you to our website. Um, we have a page, it's an, another noise page. It's www.fa.gov slash noise. And that, that's our noise landing page where we have a, a, a bunch of information uh, to share with the public uh, about aircraft noise. And in one of, those, one of those links, about halfway down on the left side, you'll see a, a link that says, learn who to contact about noise concerns. Um, when one clicks that link, they'll see uh, a series of different information. And, and one of the headings is called regional ombudsman. Uh, and you can click a link that says you can contact the regional ombudsman um, and when you, when you click that link, it gives you the contact information for the community engagement officer or the regional noise ombudsman in each of the FAA regions. So without knowing exactly where this person's from, that's probably the best place to, to find the information you're looking for. Thanks, Don. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a question. Um, Somebody's asking if we could repeat where this webinar can be seen or downloaded. Um, it can be uh, got. It can be. Um, it's going to be posted at www.fa.gov/go/aviationnoise. Um, it will also be on the FAA's YouTube channel. Uh, Joe, a question for you. Um, was time of day factored, factored into the follow-up annoyance phone survey? Uh, shorter answer is yes. Um, the um, phone survey as well as the mail survey used uh, the same day-night average sound level uh, for the respondents. Um, and that day-night average sound level implicit in its definition is to capture the, um, 
the time of day of, of the operations where they fall into the daytime period, which is 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., or the nighttime period, which is 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. Uh, so it was factored into the uh, annoyance, although I, I do want to repeat that the, the national curve was based on just the mail survey only. Uh, the phone survey was is for informational purposes and to delve into, as we spoke of, to delve into um, other reasons why people were, were annoyed. And uh, if I could jump in there, um, I had a different take on that question, it may or may not be on target, but I was um, wondering if they were thinking about when we actually conducted the phone survey with the respondent at the time of day. Um, and that was not factored in, if that's the, if that's the, the intent of the question, um, that was not factored in because we, the question was worded over the past 12 months, uh, how, how annoyed are you? Um, so we were asking the respondent to think back over the past 12 months of their experience with aircraft noise and give us their average annoyance level um, over that period. So um, it wouldn't have been appropriate to um, consider exactly what time of day the phone survey occurred. Thanks guys. Um, Joe, got another one for you. Uh, when analyzing the effects of noise, do you take into consideration the ambient noise levels in the area? For instance, uh, the, the person writing this lives in the foothills outside of Denver. It is quiet there. The sound of an aircraft is louder here as compared to cities, suburbs, etc., because there is little ambient noise. Nope, this is his question. I'm just repeating it. Joe, over to you. The, um, no, ambient is not taken into account uh, for these calculations. Uh, we're using the FAA's methodology of the integrated noise model, uh, 7.0D, uh, for a normal uh, uh, urban or suburban or even rural setting. Um, and so for the purposes of this study, ambient noise was not needed to be uh, accounted for. So uh, short answer is no. Thanks, Joe. Um, Don, can you uh, please restate where people can submit to the Federal Register? Absolutely. Um, the, the easiest way to find the link is to go to our website, www.fa.gov slash go slash aviation noise. When you get there at the top of that page, you'll see a blue box with a little lowercase i in there. Uh, and the last link says provide your comments. If you click that link, it will take you to the Federal Register. And towards the top of the, the Federal Register notice, um, you'll see a green box that says submit your comment. Um, by clicking that box, uh, it expands into a form that one can complete to submit the, the comments to the Federal Register. Thanks, Don. Um, got another question. This will actually, due to time, be the last one we, we go with. Um, this one's for you, Don. Uh, the new administration has stated it will raise the importance of environmental justice. How will the FAA be addressing environmental justice and its future noise policies? This is an important question. Uh, the Biden administration is com committed to achieving environmental justice and has tasked agencies to incorporate environmental justice into their missions or into our missions, policies, and objectives. While we can't yet specify who will how we'll address environmental justice in our noise policies, we will be increasing our efforts on environmental justice across the agency, and that will include our efforts on aviation. <laughs> Thanks, Don. All right, um, so that was the, the last of the questions. Um, I, I just wanted to you know, thank everyone for joining us. At one point, we had over 500 attendees. That's, um, that is great. Um, thank you all so much for um, joining us this evening. Um, your time is incredibly valuable. Um, and that's, you know, um, something we, we appreciate. Um, so as a reminder to make an official comment on the FAA noise research and survey discussed this evening, a link to the Federal Register notice is available at www.faa.gov slash go slash aviation noise. This is the, the link that Don just mentioned. Uh, the comment period opened on January 13th of this year and it's open for a 60 day period.
Um, we ha have been recording this webinar. It will be posted at the same website, www.faa.gov slash go slash aviation noise. And it will be available on the FAA's YouTube channel. Um, the briefing that you saw earlier will also be posted online. Um, in addition to the one with our voiceovers, one without those that you'll be able to read much more easily, that will also be there. Um, and so one last time, um, thank you all so much for your time. Thank you to my fellow panelists. Thank you very much to the research team for this incredible work that you've done. Um, we're incredibly grateful for it um, from the FAA. Um, and I hope everyone has a good evening.